Okay, listeners, your mission today, should you choose to accept it, listen to one of the true giants of modern screenwriting regale us with stories from a 90s espionage classic. My name's Al Horner, and you're listening to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies and TV shows. Each episode, a brilliant screenwriter revisits their first draft of what became a beloved movie or series. With us this week, a man who's written movies totaling over $9 billion at the box office. I'm talking, of course, about the one and only David Kep. Here's just a few of the movies that David's penned. Jurassic Park, Spider-Man, Carlito's Way, Panic Room for David Fincher, War of the Worlds for Steven Spielberg, all movies I love, making the decision of which movie of his to cover today kind of a tricky one. I threw the question over to him to decide, and his pick of the bunch was 1996's Mission Impossible, a Tom Cruise spy epic that spawned five blockbuster sequels with two more now on the way. David's Mission Impossible was markedly different to the most recent installments in the series. His adaptation of the 1960s TV show was a lean, patient spy slow burn that yes, had action, but thrived on tension and paranoia. It followed Ethan Hunt, played by Cruz, a secret agent framed for the murder of his friends and colleagues following a botched mission in Prague. The movie contained all the storytelling smarts commonplace in David's work, evident in everything from his 1989 debut Apartment Zero to last year's collaboration with Steven Soderbergh, Kimmy. In the conversation you're about to hear, David tells me about the chaos that submerged Mission Impossible at multiple points in its development, the explosive prison break scene that was cut from his screenplay for budgetary reasons, the artful exposition that's a regular feature in his storytelling, and how he approaches screenwriting versus his work as a novelist. Last month, David released Aurora, his second novel, about a solar flare that knocks out the Earth's electrical grid and sends society into, well, even more disarray than we're currently experiencing. Before we dive in, a quick reminder that Script Apart is now on Patreon. Yes, for the price of a single monthly cup of coffee, you can now support the show and help us continue to grow. We have all sorts of exciting bonus content coming this month, as well as all the usual ad-free episodes and early access to episodes as they drop. Head to patreon.com forward slash script apart if you'd like to get involved there. We really appreciate your support. Okay, this episode will not self-destruct in five seconds, that's a lie, but you should still hurry to listen to it because David is a fountain of screenwriting knowledge and great stories in this episode. So yeah, I really hope you enjoy it. Thanks as ever for tuning in. This is the incredible David Kep discussing the first draft secrets of Mission Impossible. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demeck. Hey, David. So great to meet you. How are you doing today? Wonderfully, thank you. Nice to be here. Man, it's a joy to have you on the show. I've been a fan of your work for as long as I've loved movies. And, you know, I sometimes worry when I tell people that, that they think I'm just being nice. So I figured today I was going to actually show you photographic proof of this. I'd like to see evidence, yeah. Otherwise it could just be bullshit. (laughs) This is me, age six, (laughs) dressed up as Dr. Alan Grant. You are Alan Grant, aren't you? I I mean, I am actually an Alan, so in real life. So Uh yeah, you'll note the uh, the stubble that my mom drew on in, I don't know what, how she drew it on. Oh, well done, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it is. It is genuine. What and I what say. What was that? For? Was that just for around the house, or were you headed out to a party, or what? Were you, you know, this is how spurious it was. It was a uh, World Book Day kind of dress up day at school. You were supposed to come as your favorite character from a book. I at that point clearly had never read Michael Crichton's Jurassic <laughs> Park, but um, yeah, I was. That that was the decision I made, and uh, I'm glad. You know, it was a it was it was a good move. My mom helped me out. So yeah, good times. But yes, that is that is my proof of uh, the fact that I have loved your work for a long time. And I've been, uh, yeah, it, it, some of your films that you've been involved in have been really, really formative. Um, I guess like, yeah, let, let's begin by, by saying that like, you know, all these decades on, you know, all these decades after those, those movies that were my introduction to your work, Jurassic, Spider-Man, Mission Impossible, which is what we're going to discuss today. You know, you're still making great movies, uh, sometimes in the director's chair, like with You Should Have Left. And you're also now, of course, a novelist. You know, you, you just released your new book, Aurora, which I tore through in pretty much one sitting. Um, huge congratulations. How was, how was that experience writing Aurora? Uh, delightful. 
I, I, I came to novel writing late. I, you know, I, I wrote the first one uh, probably in 2017 or 18, and this is my second. Um, and uh, I was just, I sort of blundered into it. I, I'd always meant to write a novel. It felt like, well, I should write a novel. Screenwriters, you know, we carry around a significant inferiority complex, <laughs> fo largely fostered on us by others, uh, uh, fostered in us. Um, so, you know, I, I started writing, I had what I thought was a movie idea. And I started writing some prose because I just wanted to try to understand this character. So I had this idea about a guy showing up at work to a job he hates. So I just started writing what happened. He arrives at the thing, but I was writing it in prose. And I quickly, within a couple pages, I thought, well, this is delightful. This is, this is I, I can talk about what he's thinking and feeling. I can talk about what his you know, high school geometry class was like. I, I can digress. <laughs> I can, you know, and, and I suddenly had at my disposal all these uh, literary tools that you just don't have as a screenwriter because as you know we're we're limited we we have what the audience can see what the audience can hear that's it and that's so you become it's a crafty kind of writing because you become very clever about how do I show this how do I what kind of image can I create what kind of um, you know what kind of juxtaposition of images can I have that will that will get that across and in a book you can just say it and you can, it's a dizzying kind of freedom. So you asked specifically about Aurora. That was being my second book. I wanted to tackle something that was slightly harder. I'd made it a little easier on myself in the first book by saying, well, this is a very limited time frame, small group of characters. And this time I wanted to get a bit more expansive and try some more complex intercutting between stories. So it was, again, it was, it was a really lovely experience because for me the best part of the whole writing lifestyle is sitting in a room alone making up the story and wrestling with it that that's the part I like and you get plenty of that when you write a book <laughs> did the uh did your writing ritual your writing routine did it change much writing a novel versus you know how you'd normally approach a screenplay I try not really no um I tried to approach it with a bit more patience um because screenplays are not terribly long, ideally. Um, I move through a draft pretty quickly, and that's and, and, you know my hopefully my work improves with subsequent drafts. I I don't mind doing a great many drafts, but I like to move through a draft quickly because I feel like you get this sustained state of concentration, you know, and you want to get you want to get through that draft. You want to execute it and have it done. Um, and then you go back and read it and see what's lacking or take some time or get others to read it and tell you what they think. But a novel, you have to, you, you just have to be more patient. You have to be okay with the fact that this is taking months and months and, um, and realize that, you know, some days you'll write seven, eight pages that end up, you know, you just cut the next day. Um, because you're finding the story to a greater extent as you go because you can't possibly, well, some can, I can't uh, possibly plan out an entire book in advance. I have to find it as I go. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so when we talk about that writing routine, that writing practice that you have, like, what does that actually look like? There's a character in Aurora who um, you mention as kind of swearing by naps as kind of his creative fuel. And that actually tallies up with, you know, a lot of people have told me they try and write as soon as they've woken up because you're in that kind of hazy dream state and perhaps you're, there's, there's fewer kind of inhibitions running through you. Is that part of your routine? Is that where that little detail came from? Um, yes. That's <laughs> almost autobiographical at that point. It's it, right down to describing how he takes the nap and what the room is like and the position of the pillows and the noise machine and the... Um, that, yeah, I think naps are, you know, indispensable. Um, morning writing is great if you can pull it off. I have kids, so they're also up early, so it's hard to hard to pull that off. But um, I, an afternoon nap, 10 minutes, 20. 20 is long, actually. Um, uh, they make a huge difference. I try to always lie down with a problem uh, in my head, and then your subconscious is working on it while you sleep. And sometimes you wake up with the solution. Interesting. And another kind of talking point, I suppose, about Aurora is is like Kimmy, but much more explicitly than Kimmy, the, the Soderbergh movie that you wrote that came out last year. It tackles COVID head on. 
Now, that's obviously something that, you know, is new in terms of writers deciding whether or not to kind of like thread that into the new stories they're telling. The pandemic has changed the world. It's, uh, there are kind of differing philosophies on whether or not readers want to, you know, acknowledge that that happened. How did you decide that, yes, Aurora was going to kind of tackle that head on? And, um, and yeah, again, with Kimmy, it seems like, you know, you've, you've, you've made a decision to kind of work these things into the work and, and yeah, address it. Well, they were written one after the other, and they were both written in 2020, uh, primarily and rewritten later, but, but they were both, both those works were from 2020, one right after the other. And it seemed difficult to think about, it seemed preposterous to think about a world without COVID because it had so fundamentally altered everything um, at that point. And then because of the subject matter of both, I'm all for shows and, and, and books and stories that, that ignore, that just ignore that there was a pandemic, never answer it, never address COVID. That's fine. I like to escape from it too. And it may not be particularly relevant to your story, you know? Um, so, but in both mine, it was relevant. Uh, Kimmy's a story of, you know, this rather agoraphobic woman who's got a lot of issues and neuroses and anxieties and doesn't leave her apartment for the first half of the story. And when she does leave, it's, it's rather traumatic for her to not, to not address what COVID might have been like for that woman seemed ludicrous so, or a missed opportunity. Um, so, so it was present in that. And Aurora, there's this worldwide crisis that affects, profoundly affects everybody on the globe and makes tons of them stay at home. So to not say what, to not say, have them reflect on what they already went through seemed contrived. So you're always trying to not appear contrived. You want to be effortless storytelling. But there are surprisingly, for the amount that it feels present, there are surprisingly few references to COVID in the book because it doesn't take many. Mm-hmm. You know, one of them is there's a 15 year old uh, character who's, you know, he and the woman that he lives with have gone to the store at the beginning when they know this crisis is coming and they want to load up on supplies and he doesn't want to get out of the car and he just says, I, I can't go through this again. And I think that to me is very, sums up probably how every single one of us would feel if we knew there was another impending crisis that was going to have this effect. And the other thing I wanted to get across is the Aubrey character, one of the two uh, leading characters, a brother and a sister. The brother is wealthy and overprepared and the sister is completely unprepared and her life's a bit of a mess in other ways too. And there's a line that starts a chapter that says it, it was clear to Aubrey that she'd learned absolutely nothing from COVID. And that, which is how I feel. I have no spare anything. Yeah. I have no batteries, no water, no hoard of cash. Um, and I think that for a lot of us, it's easier to just hope and pray there isn't another one than to go get ready for it. Mm. Well, you know, you brought up Aubrey from the book there and, you know, uh, it's an, it's an ensemble piece, the book, there are many characters, but, um, that particular strand, you know, you essentially have uh, the story of a scientific disaster that thrusts a reluctant parent into embracing the responsibility of childcare. Now, that's obviously something that's kind of um, a part of my guy, Dr. Alan Grant's arc in um, in Jurassic Park. You know, so I'm, I'm curious, like, when you look back at this body of work that you've amassed over all these years now, spanning all sorts of genres and, you know, now sitting across film and literature... When you look back at that, what is the connective tissue that you see? And, and what do you think it tells you about like your sensibilities as a storyteller, your preoccupations as a person, anything like that? Um, well, it has to be divided into two categories, which uh, because in film, you, you know, you can adapt things from other people's work and or you can make up your own story. So the stories I make up tend to be pretty much of a piece with one another. And that is someone, you know, that we, some, some relatable character that, that we can understand who seems like they might be like us has something extraordinary happen. I, d- I do love a big, a big idea. Um, I think that, so if you look from, you know, the first movie, uh, one of the first movies I wrote, Bad Influence, is a thriller, sort of a Strangers on a Train like thriller, certainly an ordinary guy who has something extraordinary happen. Um, the, you know, Panic Room, Kimmy, um, 
with Trigger Effect, the first movie I directed, which was also about a blackout. Um, the, a, a lot of those are sort of big idea things that happen to people who might be considered mundane or consider themselves mundane. Um, I love that stuff. I think the most formative work of art for me when I was a teenager um, was Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. Yeah, yeah. Which I think for a lot of us was, uh, was the case. My generation particularly it came out in the 50s and 60s. I wasn't alive, but it was on television every single day when I was a teenager and I watched every single one I possibly could. Um, and they were, they were some of the best science fiction and social fiction writing of, uh, really of the medium of television or film. Um, and that stuff really, really resonated with me. So I think a lot of my original work is, is, is drawn from that. In terms of adaptations, that can be all over the map. Um, I am drawn to something with a science-y premise. I love those Jurassic Park movies I worked on. Um, and, uh, you know, I loved Spider-Man when I was a kid, so I try, tried my hand at that. Um, I've adapted a fair number of books. But they tend, to, they tend to be all over the place because, you know, someone else has become interested in it first and said, hey, what do you think about working on this? So you're applying your craft um, and hopefully some art if you can get there, uh, to something that someone else has thought about for a number of years. And when you talk about finding a relatable character and plunging them into this big idea situation, do, do you start with the big idea and then think like, who is the character who would be challenged the most by this situation? What, what's your, um, I suppose we'll get into it with Ethan, Ethan Hunt in this movie, but what's your process for kind of forging a character who is the best placed to experience that big idea you've described? I would love to be one of those writers I hear on shows very much like this uh, <laughs> who say, no, no, it all begins with character. It must begin with character. Yeah, yeah. I'm just not, and I'm not sure I believe them. Um, I think you have an idea about the something. You, you don't, well, maybe you do. I don't know. Um <laughs> I, I, I think I have an idea and then I think I do exactly as you said I think who is either the best or the worst person for, possible for this to happen to in the case of Kimmy uh, I thought who was the worst possible person for this to happen to the idea was you know that we overhear uh, there are people whose job it is to listen to all those little recordings that Siri and Alexa make in our homes and to flag irregularities and try to correct the algorithm for where it misinterpreted things and I read an article that said, that talked about the people who listen to those. And I thought, ooh, that's interesting. I like that person. Uh, and what if they heard something terrible? Then I thought, who's the worst person that could happen to? And it would be someone who doesn't like to leave their house. That's why they have this job. And they must go out in order to affect a change in the world. So in that case, it was the worst. In Mission Impossible, uh, you know, that kind of spy thing, you want to think, who is the best person for this to happen to. And, and that, of course, is the indestructible Tom Cruise. <laughs> who, uh, who I think was called Ethan in an earlier draft that you in inherited, but you, you devised him. You called him Ethan Hunt. Can you tell me about like, yeah, coming onto this project and how you found that character who was going to be at the, at the heart of this thing? Because now he's sustained like seven movies and he's, you know, going into space and doing all sorts. You know. yeah. what, what were the beginnings of that character? Okay. Well, he, yes, there was. Uh, his first name existed from a previous draft. They, they tried a few times over, you know, it had been a number of years, I think, mm. they'd been working on trying to come up with that. And I, and I liked his name. I thought he needed a cool last name. And Hunt just seemed like, you know, the guy literally hunts in the movie for who's the, who's the mole. Yeah. Ethan um, Smith doesn't quite <laughs> excite. Not, not, not <laughs> quite. the same. Uh, Sorry so, to any, any Ethan Smiths listening. Apologies. Yeah. I thought it sounded cool. But the, 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 this, that script also, though, contains one of my favorite character names that I, I've come up with, which was uh, Ving Rhames character, Luther Stickle. I just thought that was the <laughs> coolest, coolest name in the world. Uh, but, you know, you can't devise a character for Cruz without devising something that takes into account who he is as a person and a movie star. Because mm -hmm. he is so singular and so dominant. Yeah, you know, I mean, his his personality is is a strong one, uh, you know, and it's <laughs> it's it's going to come through, 
So you have to you have to consider him. You're writing for Tom Cruise, and that's that's a particular thing to do. In some cases, you make up a character and you make them whoever you want them to be, and you deal with well, who's going to play this later? In this case, I knew going in who the actor was, and it was a character with a very clear and forceful persona, and so I wrote a character that I felt matched that. Yeah, it's interesting. I was um, reading a, a Tom Hanks interview the other day where he was talking about that phenomenon of like, you don't really park your knowledge of who a movie star is at the door when you when you sit down to watch a movie. When you watch a Tom Hanks movie, just like when you watch a Tom Cruise movie, you know you're watching Tom Cruise. And often, probably in fact, always the screenwriter is leaning into that and then sort of bringing, bringing that baggage to the table in terms of the script. You know, you've, you've worked with Tom a couple of times now. You did War of the Worlds and all sorts it, what was your experience working with him on this, like presumably right at the beginning of your relationship? This was this was the very beginning. Um, so it was well, it was the first movie he was involved as a producer, mm. um, and he took it very seriously. He and his partner Paula Wagner were the producers, and I came in. So they'd worked for a bit uh, with uh, Willard Huck and Gloria Katz. Uh, then Brian De Palma came on, or I don't know if Brian was on with Huck and Cats or afterwards, I can't remember. But um, Brian came on and t- did a story with Steve Zalian. They worked out a story. Then Zalian had to go either because he had something else he had to do or he got wind of a situation that perhaps <laughs> he didn't want to be involved in. Yeah. And uh, he left. And so I had just, I had worked with Brian on his previous film. I wrote a uh, Carlito's script way. for Carlito's it, Way. Yeah. And so, and Brian and I were not only collaborators, but good friends at that point. So he said, come do this, you know, please. So I, so I came on. Now I was coming on as how you enter everything always matters. I was coming on as the director's hire. Brian had recommended me. Brian asked, you know, wanted me. I don't think it was you know, that hard to hire me because I, at that point, had Jurassic Park on my resume and, and, you know, some other stuff. And so it was okay, but I think Tom was a little initially skeptical um, of me, which just, he should be. He should be skeptical of everyone <laughs> until they show that they can do what they say they can. Um, so it, it, but it came in, I already knew Brian quite well and I was very comfortable with him. So Brian and I worked, you know, we met a few times with Tom and Paul in the studio and and then Brian and I worked through um, Zalian's treatment again because they weren't done with it and um, worked out the story pretty much exactly as it exists in the movie now. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the big, the, you know, the big MacGuffin, the set pieces, the characters, that, that, that was all in place by the time we finished a, a, a story outline. That's interesting. So yeah, what was in the treatment then? And and how did, because I've read that the, the Gloria Katz script that you kind of, uh, you read, you, you wanted to go in a different direction to it. So so how how different was that script? And then how different was the treatment? I know it, it sounds like the, the log line was always, always in place and it was always going to be kind of Ethan on the run, trying to clear his own name and find the person who, all, right. all that stuff that is in the finished film. So what, what were the differing factors then that meant that it did go through so many iterations? Um, well, I think when Brian came on, he said, you know, you're, there's a fundamental flaw in Mission Impossible as a movie with Tom Cruise concept. It's, it's an idea that should not work. Um, it appears it has, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it is essentially an ensemble. That, that is its very nature. It's a team movie. Um, you know, if it's based on the television show. So, and then in the, for this ensemble movie, the one piece of casting is the biggest movie star in the world with an incredibly dominant personality. So it's just not going to work. So Brian's idea was, we have to kill everybody. You know, and, <laughs> and uh, it's a good point. That's his approach on a number of films, but... In this one in particular, it really worked. He's like, look, it's an ensemble, so we have to start it like an ensemble, kill everybody till we got one left, and he's the star, and then let him put together another team, but we'll always orient it around him, which was a brilliant idea. And Brian is very, very good at seeing what is the story here and how should it be approached. Um, 
So we went, uh, that was where, we, you know, that was our starting point. Everybody gets killed. They're on a mission. This is great because we can start in, you know, in process, uh, see everybody get killed. He's left alone. Now he must figure out what happened and put together his new team. Um, so I think that, you know, in terms of what made this, what made the script I did different from previous ones or the previous treatment, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like, much like a book, I, you know, we benefited from several years of other people's thinking in terms of what might work and what might not. Um, but I think also Brian and I were on a very nice creative role through the 90s and made, you know, some good choices together. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you talk about, you know, your vision of it as an ensemble piece, because I can't remember if it's in the first draft or in the second that you did. Well, it's not my vision. It is an ensemble well, piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's no question it's an ensemble piece. But not once the rest of the ensemble is dead. Yes, then exactly. Then you've got yourself a star vehicle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, there is a, a scene in, it's either the first or second draft, I'm, I'm blanking, but like uh, there's kind of a kind of rounding up the team sequence involving, you know, there's one kind of prison break oh, sequence in I India. The prison break. I was thinking about that prison break the other day. I want to use it someplace, but I'd probably get <laughs> sued. Uh, can I tell it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay yeah, fine. Of course. So, the, so, he's, so the team is dead, right? Bummer. Uh, he's now figured out what he thinks might be the case and he needs a team because he has to break into the CIA. Again, what's the worst possible place he could have to break in? The CIA, you know, so, um, so he's rounding up a team and we had, Brian and I had a sequence, is it, you've read it more recently than I have, is it maybe eight or nine pages of? Yeah, it's pretty, yeah, pretty the, considerable. Because we wanted each character to get their own introduction and we wanted some cool, Scenes. I think at the time in that point in the plot, it was time for a bit of action and fun. So my favorite one was someone's in a prison in India. Um, might have been Luther Stickle's character. Uh, I can't remember. But the the scene the scene starts. Uh, a guard's walking down the hall and says, "Stickle, you got a guest. You got a visitor." And he, the guy looks up. And it's a horrible prison. You know, it's a very creepy, drippy, <laughs> nasty place. And uh, he says, who is it? He says, your wife. My wife, he says in such a way to imply he has no wife. So he goes into the visiting room and sits down. And I said, what's he going to say to her? Because it would be Claire sitting there. And Brian said, there's only one thing he can say. I said, what's that? He said, hi, honey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he says, hi, honey. Claire starts to talk to him. She's putting on lipstick. She blows something into his neck saying her last words to him are, you know, be cool, something like that. He passes out, the screen goes black for a good while. We wanted a nice five seconds black. And then you, then you hear jostling and voices and, um, and he's in a black space and he can't figure out what it is. And we're only seeing because there's cracks in the surrounding thing. It's a, but he's in a coffin-like space with light coming through the cracks and he can't figure out where he is or where he's going. And he can hear... Uh, he can hear the, the, the prison, like the head of the prison and Claire talking and saying, you know, yes, of course, well, this is the, it's so unfortunate, so unfortunate, you don't have our deepest sympathies, but, you know, um, I wish we could, uh, I wish we could, uh, you know, send him back with you, but we absolutely can't because of the heat and infectious disease. The only possibility is, and then immediate cremation. And then the bottom of the box opens up and you just see fire. <laughs> And it starts to tilt upward. And so he's clinging to the inside of the thing to avoid, you know, being dumped into this incinerator. And then all of a sudden the box is jostled and cracks and there's fighting and gunshots and the box splits open. And he's on the roof of the prison where the crematorium is. And uh, Claire's there and now uh, and she's strapping something to him and he's, he's, you know, wondering what's going on. And then you see this helicopter coming and she says, you know, she's strapped the two of them together and she's like, you know, hold on. And you see Ethan dangling out of this helicopter with a hook and he, they fly over them and hook the harness and fly <laughs> off into the distance. And I just, it was so fun. And we had a few weeks before shooting, there was a, there was a matter of $3 million as there often is. And they, um, we couldn't shoot our roundup sequence. So we'd just meet them all on the train, which felt like such a disappointment to Brian and I, but Nowadays, you know, they'd get the money. They'd get the $3 million. Um, 
They'd be like, yeah, do you want to do it in space? Let's do it in space. Yeah, absolutely. They'd say, but this sequence is a bit small. <laughs> um, but it would have been fun. It would have been a great scene. And in terms of the other stuff that was kind of present in those early drafts, but for one reason or another came out, I think it was more of a romantic thread between um, Ethan and Claire. And I, th- I think it was even either a sex scene on a train or sort of the insinuation of there is about to be sex on a train. Um, yeah, what can, what else can you tell me about the things that came out from those early drafts that, that didn't quite make it to the finished film because of, well, some turbulence that we'll talk about? Um, yeah, there was more of a relationship and it was an illicit one because it was she was married to his, his boss and good friend. Um, so, you know, we wanted a triangle and we wanted it to be messy. Um, I, there was some pushback on whether that was highly moral or not. And our answer was, no, it's certainly not. But it's, you know, it's juicy. And I just think, I, I honestly can't remember if Tom or the studio or both didn't like it. But again, you're looking at what's his persona and does this fit? And is this appropriate? Is this something that he will, that he believes in and that his audience will believe in. And I think they all felt no. We thought, yeah, come on, mess him up. <laughs> Throw some dirt on him, it's going to be okay. Excellent. You know, we, we talked a moment ago about The Ambush. And I remember the first time I watched it, there's, you know, I really didn't see it coming. And uh, I was quite young at the time, but even still, I really didn't see that moment coming. You've introduced this team. There's this quite like a, uh, there's a coffee, a coffee cup discussion where they're all around the table, him and the original team that um, I, I had watched previously. I never really realized until this viewing how much heavy lifting that scene's doing because it doesn't last very long. But there's this one moment where you guess you, you establish the sense of camaraderie between these people. And without that scene, I don't know that you get to go on the journey that um, that Ethan goes on. The, it, it feels personal, the fact that these people are ripped away from him. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious about like how the ambush scene came to be. You mentioned that Brian was like, it's an ensemble film, but, but Tom Cruise is our star, so let's kill them. But but in all seriousness, was there also a um, a sense of like, we want this to be surprising. We want to shock. That is something that people won't see coming. How aware were you of like taking viewers on a ride? Oh, very. We, well, it was a, it's a spy movie. So we wanted it to be twisty. And there's betrayals and turns and, you know, uh, ex- exciting things. But you make a very good point about the scene early on where you meet the team and they're given the, that first mission. Um, Brian had shown an early cut of the movie to some filmmaker friends. And George Lucas saw it and said, uh, you're missing the spaghetti scene. I won't try to, I won't try to do his voice. Um, <laughs> he said, you don't have the spaghetti scene. And Brian said, what's the spaghetti scene? And he said, you know, where they all sit around and eat spaghetti and they get the mission. He said, you don't know who these people are. You start in the middle of the mission. Brian said, well, it's exciting to start in the middle of the mission. And George said, it's not exciting unless you know who they are. And he makes an excellent point. Um, so we went back and wrote as you point out, not a very long scene where they you you meet them quickly, right in the middle. You know very much who they are right away. Emilio Estevez and Kristen Scott Thomas, and I can't remember who else. Um, but they, um, yeah, you meet them, you get the mission, and you have a general sense that this is my ensemble cast for the movie. So then, and they all happen to be recognizable faces. So when they die six minutes later, uh, it is shocking and has a real impact. But that was a scene built to support a twist. Um, and those are those are important. So is that like a process that you have where you'll write in a twist, you'll, you'll devise a twist, and that's a case of going back and seeding in the things that are going to make that twist hit harder? Yeah. A twist doesn't work if you don't set it up. Uh, it's you, they, they're only, otherwise they're just you're writing big reversals for the sake of writing big <laughs> reversals, you know. So once you know this would be, you know, sometimes a twist will happen organically, but sometimes um, sometimes you you predetermine the twist and then say, now how on earth am I going to make that work? And and go back and set it up. So we started this conversation talking about some of the, the sort of shared DNA between all your various sort of movies and, and stories. And one thing that's uh, that's consistent in this film with the rest of your body of work is, you know, there's this history of brilliant delivery of exposition. Now, obviously, in Mission Impossible, you've got this this ready-made thing where 
they get those videos, the video briefings. Yes, you know. thank God, the screenwriter's friend. <laughs> yeah. A logical way to sit out and say, here's what you need to know. Exactly. But that hasn't always been like ready made and handed to you in, in some of your other projects. You've really had to kind of like root around and find that that way of dispensing all the information, I suppose, for the audience in a way that doesn't feel clumsy, that feels in world. And, you know, my favorite example of it is, of course, the the Mr. DNA sequence from Jurassic Park. That wasn't in uh, Crichton's novel. That was something that, you know, you decided like without Crichton's, uh, you know, prose, without his... Um, Presumably, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, yeah, no, my right, interpretation right. was, yeah, that, uh, you know, well, let's send these kids on a theme park ride and they can they can experience the information and the audience can experience the information, all the setup, all the kind of background knowledge that you need to know to, to go on the rest of this journey with these characters. They're going to experience it in, in a fun way that, that doesn't feel as clunky and obvious. What is the the trick to exposition, would you say? Like it, it's constantly sort of inventively done in your films what's what's the trick there well it, it coming up with an idea is often a function of thinking about the surroundings of the characters and the scenes and what can naturally occur jurassic park mr dna came up in a meeting with Stephen and i when we realized and i it's it's a while ago now so i can't remember whose idea it was i'm gonna say it's his because that's always safe and he uh he the idea was, hey, the realization was, hey, we're in a theme park. They would put up a little informational video. So therefore, we can see the info. It, it makes perfect sense. And it's it's in, you know, Mission Impossible 2. This is a team. They need to be told the mission. Somebody's got to give them a mission briefing. You see, you know, Top Gun 2 has a delightful mission briefing yeah, scene. It's yeah. got little visuals and models and things that you can look at. And, you know, but you you're grateful for it and you don't mind it because it's not two people sitting down and telling each other things they already know. Which leads me to the next part, which is somebody in that scene has to not know. You can't <laughs> have everyone know and say, you know, remember that time we talked about how we're gonna break into the store? You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's like they're wearing a wire or something. Um, those, so looking to your surroundings for what's the, what's the logical way to get this information across in a way that doesn't feel clunky or heavy handed. The other thing is realizing what you need to know when. You may not need to know everything you think you need. So early drafts of scripts I find are front loaded on exposition, which you can then remove or scatter throughout. I need to know this, but I don't need to know it yet. So I'm gonna take it out of page 12 and put it on page 54. Um, that helps a lot if, if information is doled out very selectively on a need to know basis. Don't panic and think you need to know everything up front. I'm working with a director right now, um, Catherine Bigelow, uh, who is allergic to exposition. Just, <laughs> boy, uh, uh, exposition, sentimentality, uh, what else? You know, this, th these are not things she, she likes. Yeah. So, um, and I tend to want things very clear. And she says, I don't care if we're confused. It's okay, we get the gist. Uh, of what's going on and it can become clear later. And she's right, it's it, in a certain kind of storytelling, this one we're doing, which is the adaptation of Aurora, um, the novel we mentioned. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a matter of knowing when you need it and how much you need and looking around to see, is there a handy logical way that this information could come out? Mm -hmm. Ooh, one thing that always um, an audience will forgive, if exposition can come out in a clunky manner or too much, if it's inconvenient for the character. If someone delivers news to that character in front of someone they would really love them not to hear it, <laughs> yeah. um, that's okay. We'll get away with that because it's bad for the character. It's, not, it's, 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 it's a setback. So that's a little trick. Interesting. And in terms of like uh, what you want to achieve with the first act, you know, by, by the time like, God, by the time we're sort of half an hour into this movie, we've had the ambush. You've announced really to the audience that like, well, these characters that we introduced very swiftly, we've, we've now brutally, <laughs> brutally dispatched. No one is safe in this movie, probably apart from Tom Cruise, if we're being honest. Like, you've also kind of, like, set in motion the intricate plot that's going to follow. We know that Hunt is on the run and he's simultaneously, like, in the fugitive. Like, you know, it, it's that kind of story template where he's on the run and he's also trying to clear his own name. As a first act and setting up what's to follow... 
it's it's really thrilling. Is there sort of a formula to like how you devise up your acts and what you want to achieve with each one? Yes, the uh, there is, and I'll 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 talk about it. But um, the other thing that's crucial to that first portion of setup that you mentioned, and this is particular to a spy movie or uh, mystery of any kind, um, is the character of the principled antagonist, uh, which is the Kittredge character. This is someone who is diametrically opposed to everything the protagonist wants to mm-hmm. do, as a good antagonist should be, um, can suspect him of, of the evil that we know he's innocent of, but is absolutely right according to his principles and the information that he has. Um, that character is super useful. It's also fun to kill that character later. We never <laughs> killed Kittredge. And I guess, uh, you know, now he's back. So, yeah. so probably should have done away with him when we had the chance. <laughs> But um, the principled antagonist, because you can't reveal who your bad guy is in a mystery of any kind. Um, so the principled antagonist is important because someone must, you know, oppose and thwart our, our hero. Um, so is there any kind of, sorry, that was not at all your question, but it was something I wanted to say. So now I've said it. What was your question? Just like whether you have a, like a, a process for kind of approaching your three acts and, and what you want to achieve in the first act. And yeah, I suppose also I'd be curious to know whether you're, you you mentioned at the top that you need an outline. I believe you said like I do. Yeah, I love an outline. I love an outline that's relatively loose. Um, I don't like to have every single detail worked out. It stifles the fun of the writing. And I work. I I, I fine tune the outline every single day while I'm writing, so that the outline's not truly finished till the first draft's finished or any draft is finished. Um, you know, I'm um, a bit old school. I like a three-act structure. Sid Field had a big influence on me in the 80s when I read that that book. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it's excessively dogmatic, but (laughs) it gives you something to embrace or rebel against. Um, And I feel that three-act structure has been around, you know, first pointed out in the poetics probably. Um, And so, you know, a good 5,000 years. Um, And human lives have a follow that same structure you know there's a there's a beginning during which very momentous things happen and and you know sort of sets the template for the rest up until we're 17 18 years old then there's a middle bit uh of our lives which is full of conflict and complexity and is difficult to structure and there's a whole bunch of characters and lots of stuff happens right and then there's the end of our life whenever that may occur and that tends to be shortish like the like the like our childhood was uh, full of consequence and with a great big ending. In our case, death uh, in stories, you know, death or, you know, myriad other things. So that's kind of it. Like it's an elephant. It's it's a, you know, tight beginning in which big things happen and, you know, not so long. Big middle section, probably the hardest part of the script to write. <laughs> and, and then tight again at the end. Um, so uh, that that's it. Was that the case in, in Mission Impossible that the second the second act was the hard one to... The second act is always awful. Yeah. So anyone <laughs> who's listening now and is writing a screenplay can tell you it's terrible. There's nothing worse than page 48. <laughs> God, in heaven. well, maybe, yeah, 58. 58 is also bad. But maybe you've got some snazzy midpoint coming up, so then you're okay. Um, yeah, middles are, are, are rough. Like, who doesn't like the beginning of a story? There's this guy and all his friends are killed. And you're leaning forward already. That's, you know, that's very exciting. And endings, it may take fine tuning to get the ending right, but you know how it's got to be resolved. You know, you have in your head, well, I'd like good to prevail and evil to be punished. And okay, well, that's starting to spell out. You know, you know it should probably be kind of exciting. They shouldn't have that much left to talk about. Um, and if you can settle it with action or visually, that's great. Um, but the middle, to keep it, to keep the flow right, to keep it from becoming boring or repetitive, you know, that's all that's all very difficult. Well, of course, it helps when you have a scene like the very iconic, the enduring scene where Ethan is is lowered into the room and he's he's copying the files, and of course, there's the rat and the bead of sweat that's gonna that's gonna threaten his whole thing. Um, talk to me about the construction of that that scene. I mean, the the tension is so palpable. How do you kind of approach that? How do you kind of maximize that tension when you write write a scene like that? That's Brian De Palma at the peak of his uh, suspenseful suspense, yeah. you know, technique right there. It, it, it's we 
we knew we wanted him to break into the CIA to get the list. So that was our, we'd had the big idea of the knock list, which some person we were doing research with a, with a, an advisor and she referred offhandedly to something called the knock list. And I said, wait, what's that? Cause it had a great you know, name and she said, non-official cover agents. It's a list of everyone who's undercover. And I said, well, that seems like a terrible thing to put in a list that anyone could get. And she said, oh yes, no, it's very well guarded. And we were like, you know, we're kicking each other under the table. Cause if that's not a MacGuffin, I don't know what is. <laughs> so, um, so we said, fine, our, our CIA renegade has to break in to, to steal it. And we started researching how you would, how the CIA is defended and the ways in which they're, the ways in which the building is secured are so boring and so predictable. You know, they got a room full of cameras watching hallways and we said, okay, so I guess we shoot the empty loop of the hallway and splice it in. And, and it was just things we'd seen a million times. And Brian and I got frustrated and Brian, you know, is quite showy and he likes, you know, he's a brilliant visualist and the idea of all these corridors was just making him sad, you know? <laughs> so we just th- chucked it all and said, let's make everything up. And, you know, I, I said, what if the floor lights up like that Michael Jackson video? You know, so we wanted the light up floor so you can't touch the, he wanted to do the top copy thing of coming down from the ceiling. So I said, okay, let's make the floor so you can't do it, which then naturally suggests the sweat. And Brian said, let's just keep piling one sensor on top of the other. The temperature can't go up. There's going to be a rat in the thing. You know, just <laughs> once, and this is a direct quote from Brian, you set the suspense hook and you milk it as long as humanly possible. And that's what we did. And his other big idea was, I want, I'm tired of all these summer movies that are so noisy. I want to do a great big set piece in the middle of a summer movie that's quiet. And he did and uh, did a brilliant job with it. That's so interesting. But the way to specifically how we wrote it is we sat in his dining room with a large box of Snyder's of Hanover sourdough pretzels (laughs) and just you know, outlined what we thought it should be. And then I went and wrote it and then he had more ideas and I went and wrote those. And then, you know, we just kept working on it. And did you, did you always know that Jim Phelps was going to be the person, the the mole, that he was going to be the person to betray Ethan? Like, how did you, how did you arrive at that as like your ending? And and how early on in the process did you have that as your destination? Well, we felt we wanted to do whatever would make Martin Lando most angry. (laughs) So... (laughs) It's not true. Not at all true. Although I hear he was displeased. Um, but we, we, yeah, we, th- that was from early on as well. The idea was, come on, let's, if we're going to be irreverent, if we're going to kill the team in the opening, let's make the good guy, the bad guy and just, you know, say the hell with everything. So that was an idea early on. And in terms of other sort of kinks in the ending there, like, I think I, I remember reading that, um, that Ving Rhames as Luther was was actually supposed to die on the train in the in yes. one of the early drafts, like Mo- all of them up all until of, yeah. rehearsals. Yeah, yeah. So was it like uh, you know because this was this was the nineties? Like, was there an awareness that um, you know the sort of the killing the black character at that point? You know, there, there wasn't a huge amount of diversity in these films. That was a trope that it was time to move away from. Or how did that end up changing so last minute? I suppose. He's now in seven movies. That was a great decision. <laughs> That's panned out well. By Ving. There was, it was his note. Oh, uh, really? To answer your question, no, there was no awareness whatsoever. It was the mid-90s. Um, I didn't realize, mm. uh, you know, I didn't, I, I, I hadn't thought about it. And we were, we were sitting in, to be fair, a lot of people die. You know? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but the, we were sitting in rehearsals in uh, Prague and I remember we'd finished, it was a read through, things had gone well. We we're starting shooting very soon, a couple days maybe. Brian said, okay, anybody else got anything? And Ving said, yeah, I got something. I said, okay. He said, how come the black guy gotta die? And we said, uh, what do you mean? He said, how come the black guy always gotta die? And we said, well, lots of people die, Jim <laughs> dies. You know? And he said, yeah, I don't wanna die. And there wasn't much discussion. We because it we sat with it. When someone points out something like that and says, "How come the black guy always got to die?" If you're sentient, if you're alive on the planet, you take a second and you think, and you go, "Oh yeah, the black guy always does die." It had it had not occurred to me. Yeah. Um, so there was very little discussion after that. Brian and I looked at each other and said, 
fair point. <laughs> then we went and made him live. And I'm glad he did. I'm glad he spoke. I'm glad we did it. And I'm glad seven movies later, <laughs> Bing still got a good gig. Did you have any sense when, um, well, I suppose you probably didn't. I was going to ask whether you had any sense that this thing could spawn the franchise that it has. But, you know, that from, from what I know, and I'd love for you to give me the breakdown. There was such turbulence around the production and around the script that <laughs> you, you probably didn't. I mean, you know, forget wondering if it will spawn seven sequels. You were probably wondering, will this film even get made? Right? Yes, there was a lot of there was a lot of turbulence. So I then, after I wrote a few drafts, it had gone well. Paramount said this is great. Brian said this is great. Everybody said, go make your movie. We're very happy with it. Tom, however, was not yet pleased. Um, in part, I, I, I think it. I think it worked quite well. You'd have to ask him what what he felt didn't work yet about it. Um, but he he wanted Robert Town to come in, with whom he collaborated a couple times, to come in and work on um, principally his character. So I, I didn't like that. Uh, Brian didn't, didn't like that, but. At this point, the movie's greenlit, and the only way it's going to go forward uh, with Tom's enthusiastic participation is if Bob Town does come in and work on it. So, so they hired Bob. I, you know, was quite self-righteous uh, about it all. Um, you know, you get you get fired a fair amount in this uh, in the screenwriting business, but you never get okay with it. And if you are okay with it, it's probably a sign you didn't give a shit, and that's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. So, um, I thought it was okay of me to be upset that, you know, and think that that's not the way it could. That when he first came in, it was to consult and there were a couple awkward meetings with me and town and Brian and, and Tom. I don't think anyone enjoyed those meetings particularly. <laughs> um, and I get it. It's a, it's an, it's a big expensive movie with a movie star and a star director. And I'm, you know, it's not the story of my parents' divorce. I don't have any particular moral rights to this story, but I cared. So anyway, I, I fucked off as I was invited to do. And they went off to London to start prep. Um, town then started really taking apart the script, but not turning it in. And they started getting very, there was a lot of anxiety. And three weeks before, Brian and I were still in touch because I was, you know, I, I, was, I was enjoying his misery because <laughs> though he was my friend, he had, you know, through no fault of his own, been present when I was fired. So I was, you know, I wanted to hear stories about how badly it was all going because that was, you know, because I'm petty. <laughs> and so, the, but then they called and said, will you come back? When you come to London, we start in three weeks, but the studio is going to shut us down because we don't have a script. I said, but I gave you a script. Did you lose it? <laughs> um, and uh, they said, ha ha, uh, just come. And so, uh, so I did. So I went to London, started working again, probably with a fairly sizable chip on my shoulder, but I was, I was pleasant enough about it. But they kept town on. So uh, they had us at separate hotels because uh, they, I guess they didn't want any fights in the lift. I don't know. <laughs> could you take him? Um, I mean, I have a few years on him, so I feel like <laughs> I probably could have, but he's savvy. He's, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's used to Hollywood and it's dirty tricks. Yeah, so he, yeah. You know, um, so anyway, I, um, I was in one hotel, Town's in another. I'm writing for Brian, Town's writing for Tom. There's a lot of arguing about what pages are going where. Um, I remember one, at one point I stayed up pretty much almost for three days straight. I was sleeping just as I had to. I had a separate room in the hotel from my wife and young son, and I... I was staying up for three days to rewrite, try to cobble together the script so that the studio wouldn't shut us down. Um, and the studio had been quite up in arms and they, they said, you guys are over budget and there's not, the, script, the script is not in good shape. Uh, we're coming over there. So like seven of them flew over on the Concorde, stayed at the Dorchester for three or four days and flew back on the Concorde and charged, you know, $150,000 to the budget that was so over budget. And yeah, it, was, it was, it was a really wacky time. Yeah. So I finished, uh, once shooting started, I felt like 
I was done and I left. But, you know, I think the, the, um, the, the battling over the pages continued, the battling over the script continued all the way through shooting. Tom and Brian were not a natural mix. Brian's an auteur. Tom's an auteur, mm. uh, for that matter. So, you know, um, two auteurs uh, get on a high-speed train sounds like a setup for a joke. Yeah. <laughs> or a great screenplay. Or a crash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but when, it all worked out fine in the end. Well, yeah, like when, when was the moment you, when you realized it was going to work out fine? When you real, Maybe you, it was when you saw the first cut and you realized this works somehow. <laughs> By the grace of God, this thing has come together. And yeah, when did you also realize that it was striking a chord with audiences? Um, right away. When I saw the first cut, I remember the the CIA sequence was already spectacular. Yeah. And uh, and you know you just knew oh this is gonna, this will this will work. Um, and then you know subsequent cuts it was too confusing. However, um, I think some of the principal differences that Tom and I had over the the development of it were. I felt it was too confusing and he wanted it to be more complex. And, you know, hopefully we came, the, the movie ended up in the, the, the right middle ground. Yeah. Um, it did work very well um, with an audience who enjoyed saying that it's so confusing. So, like, they were okay with that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's funny, like, um, the, the the sequels now, like, Watch. I can. I guess. I love these sequels, and the the only analogy that feels right is like it's like watching or like listening to like a mad EDM rave band, then going back to that band's first album, discovering it was like an indie folk record. <laughs> it's like it's it's come a long way, and it's gone through these sort of tonal evolutions since then. I think both sort of ends of the spectrum in the Mission Impossible franchise are, are fantastic. But yeah, when when you kind of uh, presuming that you do kind of watch these sequels as they come out, do they? Do you still feel that this is your movie? Do you still feel a connection? Or uh, yeah, no, because it's not. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it's, it has the title and the character, um, but it's not mine if I didn't work on it, you know, I can, uh, so no. And it also, as you say, it has, tonally it has shifted and it's become something else. It's become something else that's very entertaining, um, but it's, it, I, I don't feel any, I, I don't, I don't feel a part of it. I, I hope I don't say it with any bitterness. It's just, I'm not a part of it. So mm -hmm. it's not, it's not something that I feel particularly connected to. Same with subsequent Spider-Man movies, or probably Jurassic World as well. Jurassic right? movies, yeah. yeah. It's it's something that I feel like lucky to have been a part of uh, all of those, particularly at the beginning, which tends to be the most fun, <laughs> um, because you're not reacting to somebody else's anything. You're yeah. just, you know, coming up with something new and and trying to see if it'll work. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel lucky to have been a part of all of those, but I don't necessarily feel a connection to the subsequent ones, or I don't. Yeah. And, um, you know, this was this was one of many high points in your career, but the, the sort of life and times of a screenwriter and a novelist, like there are ups and downs. You know, there are films that you've been involved in that haven't quite connected in the same way as this film. You know, when, when you look back at your career, you know, if Mission Impossible is one of the times where it was a crazy ride, but it came together and it ended up with a great film. Are there sort of particular moments that you kind of look back on with a little bit of regret or sort of there are particular films where you're like, I mean, obviously the, the one <laughs> yeah. that like, uh, you know, uh, personally, I kind of found a lot to a lot to love in Crystal Skull, for example, the Indiana Jones movie. But like, yeah, when, when you look back at your films, sort of where are the kind of counterpoints to this high? What are the films that like uh, didn't quite work out that um, you have a little bit of regret? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> If you think I'm going to drag out the, the list of dead, it's like the it's like uh, uh, bring out your dead in uh, Holy Grail. Um I don't think I'm going to throw those bodies on the cart and parade it through the street right now. Yeah, sure. But they, they, you do, I, I, I treasure my failures in retrospect because I, I did learn an awful lot from them, each one. And, and I know why and how they all happened. It doesn't necessarily prevent me from making those mistakes again. Um, I've tried to push myself into things that I, I've tried to push my creative muscles to the point of failure. And I have uh, failed, you know. Um, Crystal Skull, there's a lot to like in it, as you say, which is a diplomatic but also truthful way to, to, to say it. I was never happy with the idea. When I came on, I tried to convince them to change it. I had this other idea. They didn't want to change it. I'm not saying mine would have been better, but I think that a lot of the pushback that movie got 
you know, in a larger sense, aside from little things people might not have liked, you know, that were too silly or whatever. Um, you know, the larger one was we don't feel like aliens should have been in a, in a Indiana Jones movie. Fair enough. Um, in retrospect, you're probably right, <laughs> you know. Um, the, the other stuff, they're usually, it's usually, things that go wrong are usually wrong from the idea. It's fruit of the poison tree. It's rarely, boy, that was a great idea, but if only we'd execute it a little better. No, it's usually it wasn't a great idea and you executed it as hard as you possibly could and you couldn't overcome it. So what was the indie idea that you were excited about that just you couldn't Oh, convince? like I'm telling you. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you. Then, then that'll be judged. No, it's much better if I don't say what it is because then it'll be this misty, ethereal thing that's probably brilliant. Very true, very yeah. true. Excellent. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, looking to the future, you, you, we've mentioned over this that, you know, you are working with Catherine Bigelow now. There is an Aurora, uh, you know, an Aurora movie adaptation coming up. That must have been a strange experience adapting your own work and, uh, yeah, finding the way to condense that story, I suppose. What, what else? Like when, you, when you've achieved everything that you have achieved, what's left for you to kind of conquer, do you think? Is there, are there things you haven't got round to yet that are still like on your list? Oh, yeah, just stories I, want, I would like to tell. There are several. Um, and every single time, it's not as though, oh, I told a good story once, therefore this one will be easy. Every single time a story can kick your ass and you can think more of it than it deserves to be thought of. And, uh, or you can execute it poorly or in a distracted way or, or hastily. Um, so telling a story is enough. Telling a good story in itself is enough of a challenge every single time. But you still enjoy it. I do. You're still here. I, as long as the, the quiet days when I'm trying, I'm privately wrestling with that thing and doing my, you know, uh, doing my ugly creative bits in private. Um, those are my favorite days. And I still love those. <laughs> well, apart from the Aurora adaptation, is there anything else you can tell me about projects you've got coming up, David? Um, I'm working on... Uh, uh, an adaptation of Cold Storage, my first novel, which oh, the British director Johnny Campbell is doing, uh, that was supposed to start in October, now looks like January. Um, that's for Studio Canal. I, I'm, I'm excited about that because that was a fun book. Um, and uh, also, been I'm working on The Green Hornet for Universal, trying to come up with a new and exciting way to tell that story. Exciting. So that one is someone else's idea. Other, other than that, lately, I've been working on my own ideas. Amazing. And, and looking forward, do you see yourself, um, now you've, you've got two novels under your belt and by the sounds of things, you really enjoyed the process of doing Aurora and, be, and having access to all that interiority that you can, you can do. I think the, the analogy, the, the, the example that you used at the beginning of this was what their, you know, high school teacher was like in their geometry class or something like that. Now that you've, uh, been bitten by that bug, do you see yourself kind of doing, uh, you know, half and half novels and screenplays or uh, where do you think what's the division of labor going forward also balancing the fact that you're a director as well I think I'll always write screenplays I, I most of my ideas show up announcing themselves as movies so I and I love them I love movies and I love I would like to try a limited series because to me telling something over eight hours seems exciting and I like to watch them um and novels are fun too. I don't know. I I love to I'd love to not have a plan uh, and decide on an idea by idea basis. Where should this go? What is this? How does this want to be told? Um, and hopefully stay open to a surprising answer. Well, that's a beautiful way to to leave things, David. Thank you so so much for this conversation, man. It's been so much fun. I've just realised that I'm probably going to have to put that embarrassing photo of me dressed up as Dr. Alan Grant on our social media. No, oh, you have yeah. to. You have to. You're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> it's just my mum's grown on stubble. That, by the way, was about the extent to which I've ever been able to grow facial hair. <laughs> so yeah, there we go. Anyways, David, thanks so much, man. This has been so much fun. My pleasure. Thanks. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>